Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Um, Y'all know we are famous for tobacco, bourbon, and horse racing. So that aside, uh, we, I'll hope you will understand after I talk to you this morning about why we were selected as one of the hubs. We are so pleased to be a part of this project. And I've been watching it since its very, very beginning. So I'm just thrilled as can be. We started digitizing and building a digital library in around 1998 in Kentucky with the support of the uh, Council on Post-Secondary Education and the state-assisted academic libraries around the state. We started out with finding aids. That was our first project, was getting find aids from the archives around the state and providing access so that people could know what are in these archives and expose that content. And that went really well. Then we thought, well, we could do photographs. We could, you know, that was doable, so we did that. Um, and if you can do photographs, you can do maps, you know, so we added maps to the mix. Then um, the English department at UK had a microfilm scanner that the, they gave to the library. It's like, well, what can we do with this microfilm scanner? We've got microfilm, you know, we've got lots of microfilm. So we did a book project with the support of IMLS to get books about Kentucky that were damaged, rare, that we had on microfilm, make those accessible digitally. This, we, this was just such a precious project. We just like made it so, uh, it was very boutique and it, the images looked great. And then we thought, well, um, if you can do books on microfilm, certainly we could do newspapers. Then we saw the announcement from NEH for the National Digital Newspaper Program. And we never ever thought about outsourcing this work. We thought, oh, we can do this. It's like kind of like those old Judy Garland uh, movies where they say, we can have a show. It's like, yeah, we can have a show. We can digitize new newspapers. It's like, oh gosh, I would never advise anybody to start with newspapers, let me just say that. Um, then we went into archival collections, manuscripts, and then finally audio and video in our oral hist rich oral history collections. So I'll tell you a little bit about those different kinds of content as we go forward. This, you know, these early projects we had, they were very boutique, and as I'm, I call them precious objects, because we, you know, every pixel was perfect. And we spent a lot of time, we quickly realized it was not scalable. It was not cost efficient. There was no way we could do the volume that we really needed to do if we approached the projects in that way. But we learned a lot from that and took those learnings and moved them forward. Um, as we move from this boutique process to a mass digitization project, uh, process that we use as we go forward, we are taking everything that we can, automating it, making it fast, doing everything that we can to create the tools to make this a quick process so that we can work toward mass digitization scale. So we, are, we continue to kind of tweak that and make it better. Each, this is something that's a continuing, ongoing process for us, and it is working. We are happy to say that um, it is actually working. So as we looked at our archival collections, we worked with our archives to say, how are you processing these collections? And they were wanting to get their collections on quickly as well. And so how are you going to do that? Can you work on that workflow from the very beginning to processing the collections up through digitizing them? And they were amenable to doing that. So we're continually working on that and ramping that up so we can get more content on very quickly. Our repository infrastructure, we have been forced through a number of you know, changes technically to examine that, uh, that structure. We had content management systems, but we didn't have the preservation aspect that we really wanted. So over the last couple of years, we've been working on building a repository structure. It is based on the model, the microservices model from that was developed really with the um, California Digital Library. And we start with just a, a file store. Anything can go into it. We can package up, we're thinking about born digital collections, congressional collections coming to us that are all digital. Where are we going to do that? We can't, don't have the luxury of sticking those in a box in the basement till we have time to uh, process them. because so we want to make sure they're secure forever. 
So we are building that into that workflow into the repository infrastructure. We were going to build this uh, management system ourselves because we're a can-do kind of shop in Kentucky. We, we thought, oh, we can develop a whole digital management system. And I think we could do it. But our programmers went to Curate Camp and they met the folks from the Florida Center and Library Administ um, Automation. And they had rewritten their dates software, Dark Archive in the Sunshine State. And um, I, I don't think they really go use that acronym or the full blown uh, title for that any longer. It's, it's really, they refer to it as dates. And our guys came back and said, hey, you know, they're built, they've built out using Ruby, our, the programming language that we use, um, they've built this out already, so we have adopted that. Um, we have also have put on a discovery layer using Blacklight. So it's, a very, it's all built with open source tools. And the important thing about this is we can store things in a very secure repository. So all of our digital content is protected, and we're confident that it's protected. In addition to that, we are sharing that software. All the work that we have done over the last two years, we're making it available so that other libraries can take that on and don't have to spend that development time and can easily tweak it and put it in place to, uh, for their own repositories. So a little bit about our collections. Emily mentioned we have 800,000 pages of newspaper content, and we do. It's a, a lot of newspapers. Uh, we have books, um, finding aids, photographs, manuscripts and um, archival collections, maps, oral histories, and then other kinds of serial publications and paginated publications. Now, this is growing exponentially. If you look at those numbers, you know, um, if I was trying to think about how to put it on a graph, and I'll just describe it, it's just ramping up incredibly fast. For instance, in the last year, we have tweaked these processes so much that in the last year, we scanned in our shop over 300,000 pages. 300,000 images are, of this content that we have were done in the last year. So it is ramping up very, very quickly. Now, the one thing that we're hoping um, that will happen, and I'm confident this will happen, is that we're reaching out to other libraries and archives around the state, and the DPLA the chance for them to have this on-ramp to a national program is going to be the hook that we need to get them to participate with us, with the Kentucky Digital Library. So we're very grateful for the opportunity, and it really falls in line with the mission that we had already. So we are, the way we're going to spend the money is we're going to focus on our strengths, the strengths that we have. The National Digital Newspaper Program really provided us that framework to do newspapers. We know newspapers, and while we did it ourselves, we were the only one of the first partners that didn't think of outsourcing it. It's like it just never occurred to us. People say, why didn't you contact the vendor? Because everybody else did. It's like, well, we didn't really think of it. You know, we, you know we, we wanted to do it ourselves, and we were confident we could do it ourselves. And I think we actually were given the money thinking, can they really do this? I mean, I really think there was some skepticism at the beginning, but we did it. And while we went through that process, we learned newspapers. Uh, I think we know newspapers as much about newspapers as any place in the country. And so we, we've done, we've participated in NDNP, and we're so grateful for that support, and it's been wonderful. And we have taken that knowledge and have expanded it way beyond our NDNP content. So the standards were set, there was a high volume, and we pushing that uh, project forward. We've now, we do outsource pieces of this now, but we're retaining those parts that need our expertise, and we have learned which parts to give away and to contract with to make it faster. Here's an example of a paper that is, um, it was the Kentucky Gazette. This, this is a partnership with our Lexington Public Library. They had a whole run of this paper, starting from 1789. And 1789 was a long time ago in terms of newspapers, but they had, these, they had a bad microfilm copy. So we thought, you know, let's see if we can digitize this from the source documents using what we know about newspapers and really go for it. 
And so this is how it displays up in our, um, in our content management system in Blacklight. We've got the page image. Um, you can switch, the user can switch views from that image. So you can see the thumbnails of how many are, objects are in that issue, for instance. Um, you can get the details of that, the metadata that's there, and then the text. It is, we did some OCR on it. It's kind of crazy OCR because you've got these characters that look like Fs, but they're Ss. But, so the user can actually look through there. This is a project that I think we could do some hand cleanup with volunteer effort, a collaborative kind of thing, to make the searching even better for this. And then you can get a PDF uh, version of this as well, the, the newspaper. So you can get deep down into it. You can look at it. This paper is so interesting. There's lots of um, ads on the front pages for people that are missing. It's like people went missing all the time, apparently, in, in 1789. <laughs> And I thought it was so interesting because, um, for one t t example, like apprentices, they must have treated their apprentices really badly because people, they were constantly running away and there were ads for them, things like, um, and he is wearing this, but he might have friends that could give him a different suit of clothes. It's like, really, they had one outfit, that's it? You can identify somebody by the clothes, you know. So. It's those kinds of things that you don't know. It gives you a, a sense of what life was like in the 1789 in Lexington, Kentucky. So I, I thought it was very interesting. So our newspaper content is rich. We have so much newspaper content. Um, because Kentucky, the way it was placed, a lot of the westward expansion happened right through Kentucky. And this is documented in our newspapers. We have Appalachian titles. So learning about Appalachia, what kind of what life is like in these communities, in coal camps in Appalachia, we've got that. We've got some African American newspapers that are rare, rare, rare. And you just can't find them. We're always on the search. We've partnered with the um, African American Encyclopedia Project. And as they look for content for that, they're on the lookout for newspapers as well. Civil War newspapers, we've got lots of Civil War newspapers, and because we're a border state, we have both perspectives on that war. And then the daily racing form, you know, this goes back to our horse racing. We have digitized a lot of the daily racing form in partnership with Keeneland Library uh, at the Keeneland Race Course. And so, uh, oral history is another thing. Emily mentioned our oral histories, and we've got a long history with oral history. We've got 30 years of oral history, some really rich collections. And we've got um, the New Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky, and really one of the experts in moving oral history into the digital age. How do you provide access to this? And we, that, a lot of that expertise resides uh, with Dr. Doug Boyd at the Louis B. Nunn Center. One thing that we have struggled with and that has been a, sort of a, an impediment to getting oral history online is how do you search it? How do you find the part, you, you know, to listen to a two hour uh, interview for that part that you, that one little part that you want, that can be, you know, kind of hard. And then getting the transcripts, that is one of the impediments, or the transcripts for, it costs about $200 an hour to do a transcript for an or, oral history. And so that really, that barrier is for smaller places, that is just enough to make them say, we can't do it. And so we're really moving beyond the transcript, looking at indexing things. We have developed some software that allows you to search through, if you have a transcript, to search through the transcript and get to that part of the interview, to listen to that part. And we're realizing that in, in addition to that, people, when they're going to talk, for instance, about this about civil rights. They don't say, now I'm going to talk about desegregation. You know, they'll talk all around the subject, but they never say the word desegregation, so you can't search on that word. So we're looking at indexing, putting it, overlaying that with an index that would allow you to look at that and then get to that part, a subject index for these oral histories. And, with, and I would mention that we're working on that OMS software with support from IMLS. This is a grant that we're going to make this available, this software, for any content management system that we can think of, including Content DM, which many, many small libraries have, so that they can get their oral histories online. 
This is a project that I think is so exciting uh, this, from Come Back to Kentucky. This is an interviews that we did with student veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we thought we'll capture these stories as they come back from the war and as they integrate back into campus life around Kentucky. And so we've done a number of these interviews. The theater department at UK has then taken that and created the, um, a play around it, and then they actually perform that off-Broadway. So there's, these kind of things can build once you get that content out there. Now, we'd, I'd like to show you one of these interviews, and we're going to um, play this. This is Taylor, Tyler Gayhart, who was uh, returned from Iraq. And this shows the index that you can get to. So you can actually search the index. You can hear uh, Tyler speak. And then if you flip over to the transcript, you can, you can actually scroll down through that transcript. If you find a part you want, you click, and it goes to that part of the transcript. Or you can do a search through the transcript to get to um, something. If you search on parents, for instance, I think, let's see if we can. I don't know if they can type up there. Can, can you type? parents into that keyword search box? And see, then you can see, scroll down in the index below if you click on one of these on the side. I'm originally from And it goes to Frankfurt, that point Kentucky, in the interview. So, so this. I was born in Ashland, Kentucky, uh, but I ended up moving. So I think these are uh, kind of amazing kind of moments that you can get when you get your oral history out there. So if we can just go back to the presentation, that would be great. Grew up in Frankfurt. So I, I think that's where the magic happens when you get those, that kind of content together. Uh, we've got collections on all these kind of topics. Um, we found around the state, there are some interviews with World War I veterans. Those are very rare. And they're on reel-to-reel on, um, -reel tapes. So as part of this, we're going to digitize that and get those online. But we've got lots and lots of collections around the state that, on various topics that'll be very, very interesting, I think. Um, our archival collections, these are some of our strengths in our archival collections. We've got uh, civil war, slavery, civil rights, um, commerce. We've got um, Toms Clark, one of our historians, went around the South and collected ledgers from small country stores. So we've got all those. So those are the kinds of things we want to get into the DPLA. Here's an example of a, a civil war diary that we have. And I think one of the community engagement pieces, we'd like to get transcripts made from these. So somebody, Civil War buffs, and there are lots of them, um, would be happy to do a crowdsourcing project and get these so they're searchable. And they're fascinating when you read them. And so really part of what we want to do is empower others. We want to do metadata training for the archives around the state. We'll do digitization from some of these um, smaller places and then create that on-ramp um, for other institutions to get online. We want to do uh, public events. We're going to have scanning events where people bring their treasures and we scan them and, and add uh, that content into our library and really engage with those specialized communities like Civil War buffs, like uh, uh, genealogists and those kind of things. And so really, this is helping us get that last mile that we've struggled with. It's like, how do we get to those places? This is allowing us to do what we want to do anyway. This is, allows us to do that, fulfill that part of the mission that we never had the ability or the funding to do. This is doing it for us, and we're just so happy about it. And so we really want to engage the community in such a real way, and this is going to be a huge thing for us. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you to all the funders. We are extraordinarily grateful for this opportunity, and we hope to do you proud. We'll, we'll, uh, I'm excited to work with the rest of the, the partners, and it's going to be awesome. Thank you very much.